What problems are troubling you? What's frustrating you, bothering you, worrying you? Want solutions? Want answers? Welcome to Here We Come to Save the Day, hosted by David Adelson. This podcast is dedicated to solving everyday and global problems in an uplifting, fun, enjoyable way. There is a solution to whatever is troubling you. Ask your questions and we'll do our best to give you practical, useful, workable solutions you can use starting today. Join us now with David's special guest experts who will share their own experiences, life lessons, and practical strategies for creating the life you long for. Start living your best life today, right now, with David Adelson and friends. Welcome to another fun, exciting, uh, samurai-filled episode of Here We Come to Save the Day. Uh, My guest today is Shane Fielder. Is it Fielder or Felder? Fielder is correct, yes. Fielder, okay. Um, Who is a modern samurai. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about who you are. And you have learned to... Uh, you basically studied massive brand businesses in this country and learned what makes them so powerful and successful. And you've applied that plus your samurai knowledge. Um, your, uh, we'll, we'll, I'm just going to read your bio now. I know I told you we we're going to do it differently. But uh, Shane uh, Fielder is a modern-day samurai with a fourth-degree black belt in Aikido. 24 years ago, he basically started exploring what he wanted to know what made large national brands extremely successful over uh, compared to locally grown entrepreneurs. Um, and he pursued that uh, business education by working with iconic brands uh, that you and I and everyone has probably helped build. And during this time, you discovered how to apply big brand corporate success secrets into a variety of businesses to create highly profitable results. And your company is Samurai Innovation. That's correct. And you're here today to help people by giving them some of these ideas and some of these principles so that they can take advantage of what the big brands do on their small, tiny town budgets. Is that correct? That's correct. We can cover that for sure. Thanks for having me. So why don't you just give me one or two sentence idea of what we'll cover so people will want to stick around and then we'll go from there. Absolutely. So I think it would be great to cover how businesses can build a big brand presence on a small local budget. And that's definitely one thing that we can cover. And then we'll also cover the mindset and the viewpoint, the point of view that the owner or the operator of the business has to have so they can actually achieve that. Okay, those are incredibly powerful, and I want both of those, so I'm excited. So I just want to remind everybody to like uh, uh, and give a review of the podcast, subscribe to our podcast, Here We Come to Save the Day. Um, And I also want to remind, just share it with your friends, spread it around. We give a lot of very useful advice. It all seems to be around spiritually oriented entrepreneurship and building and building relationships um, but it's all good stuff for the heart good stuff for the mind so check out which episodes uh, are will be useful to you and share them with your friends and give them a five-star rating and buy billboards for them whatever you feel to do to to uh, to share that um, also uh, here we come to save today is sponsored by the peace and harmony company peace and harmony co.com and we make quantum-infused and unified field-infused programs and products that you can use to solve everyday problems in the simplest way possible, including the problem of peace and harmony within your own family, within your own business, within your own neighborhood or community. This is a time because of the development of, of quantum programs that we can heal things, we can affect things from the quantum field, from the unified field, which is outside the realm of space and time. And you can actually buy peace for your neighborhood, for your police department, for your prison, for your hospital, for people overseas, you can sponsor it. Uh, We have systems that are on the homepage of Peace and Harmony CO called Peacemaker Systems that you can use to affect 10,000 people to 30,000 people, 10 square miles to 30 square miles, and you should get them. You should 
just get them and use them. And if we get enough of them, a lot of the chaos in the world will evaporate <clears throat> overnight so quickly. So um, please take advantage of that. And there's even a free sample you can click and download and try. And people love them. So I want to encourage everybody to do that. So now I want to... I want to I want to touch on your your uh, Shane on what you want to talk about. Um, I know, huh? I'm getting. I want I want to say this to people now that you have a special planning course that you've created, and we'll tell them how to receive this uh, during the episode too. So I want to get that out of the way. But tell me a little bit about the major shifts you think people need to take to become, uh, I don't know if you, a national brand or become highly influential on this small town on budget. So where would you start? I think when one of the things we have to start is let's get out of the way, David, early on, <clears throat> the complaints. Okay. So a lot of complaints that I've heard over the years, and I used to be in that category until I joined the, the ranks of the corporate large franchise businesses and found out what all the practices and secrets are. One of the complaints is, well, that's really nice for a big company, but I can't do that. I don't have a big company budget. I don't have a corporate budget. So the big machine just keeps on surviving and thriving and they're gobbling up all the smaller local independent operators like me. And I think that's one thing that we have to address early on. There's truth to every every side of the equation, but there's also some false uh, thinking that's in there. Never has it been easier in today's day and age to look big, be big, and seem big to that, to that user or that visitor that's going to buy or adopt your products and services because everybody has a website today. And everybody's website can look just as great or even better than some of the large corporate websites that are out there. So everybody can hire a branding designer to create a corporate professional looking brand image. Everybody can have that translated to their website. You can hire copywriters that can help you create your copy. So never has there ever been a time in human history where we've had easy access and easy point of entry into any market that you want to get into. Now, from that point forward, it's how you differentiate yourself in the market, how, you, how your product or service differentiates itself. I mean, you selling peace, that's a whole different differentiated idea. And the fact that you have a device and there's a way that you can do it. And if you don't want it in your area or you have enough and you want to sponsor someone else, like you've got a, you've got a different concept there that's very differentiated and you're able to promote that. And so whether you're a local person selling coffee, cupcakes, or you're selling a professional service, it's easier today to get access to look like a big brand, even though you're a solopreneur, you're a solo operator, or maybe you're a small team of five, or you started in the garage and now you're moving to your first commercial premise. So I think that's the number one mindset is it's easy to look and feel polished and professional. And because today people, that's that's been one of the secrets. So if we go back to say the late 90s when I started venturing away from entrepreneurism into corporate, back then it was not easy to access a brand designer. It was not easy to find someone that could create a logo and signage and all this other stuff. The websites, <laughs> I mean the web was just starting then. Websites were horrible, they were ugly, they were clunky. You had to have a, almost a programming degree to be able to build a website. Today, that, that's, so the barriers to entry have, have been removed. So I think as long as we start saying and thinking, okay, how do I access those people? Who do I access? And there are lots of people that will fit your budget. If you say, I want a $500 brand identity and logo created, there's a designer out there that will do the job for $500. There's some that'll do it for 200 and some will do it for 2000. So I think it's really easy to match up with the right person and energetically you'll find the right person that's, you know, you'll find somebody just coming out of design school that says, Hey, if I could get $500 to do your logo, that's a win win for both of us right now. Five years from now, they won't do that logo for $500. But right now in both of your space and time, you'll match up and you'll be able to, to, to do good work together and you benefit them. They benefit you. So I think there's a lot of win win relationships. So now let's shift the mindset to, okay, 
you're able to compete. Now, how do you want to go out and compete? Yeah, and this is great. How do you want to go and compete? One of the things that I love and I love about you bringing it back to the 90s is not only is it because of COVID and even because of what's been going on on the internet, major major national brands have been closing their retail outlets. You don't need 50,000, 200,000, whatever it is now to get a big building to, to get an architect to build a skyscraper so that your logo can be on the top. Now you can, you know, $50 a month, you can go, I don't, I, I'm guessing some of the, I know there's click funnels, lead pages, Wix, mm -hmm. uh, WordPress sites that you can find, you know, for, for a hundred dollars a year, you can have a website that has amazing presence. Um, where would you go? I know uh, there are places that you can go to match up to find the student designer student or the person who's, you know, just finishing their copywriting course or whatever. Where would you go to look for, for people? Where do, where do you recommend people to start with for that? Well, number one, Upwork is a really good place for some of the professional design services. Um, there's, <laughs> I'm a little biased because I'm married to a designer. Okay. And so <laughs> I just go upstairs and say, Cheryl, I need this, this, and this. And yeah, and your prices are, <laughs> right. And she doesn't charge you the same thing that she might charge the rest she of She gives us. me the friends and family rate. But yeah, yeah. Um, there's 99 designs, you know, so there's 99 designs. There's Upwork on, on that front. There's really good, talented people there that will do great work. There's Fiverr, you know, there's different places like that. So yeah. the uh, access to that is easier today. Yeah, I have to say that I have, uh, I used to work with a marketing company uh, way back when, and they used to just do designs. And I know stories of where they'd be in the meeting and the guy would be telling them the design and there'd be the rep there and then the designer would be there and he'd be just doodling. And by the time they left the office, he had the, he had their logo. He just showed it to him then. He's going to go and, you know, do the, it takes me three weeks to do this or whatever. And he, he'll do it up professionally, not the rough sketch, but he has it leaving. And they, and this is in the you know mid eighties and they were charging $1,500 in, in a small town in the Midwest, what to say of what they would charge, you know, in the big city for that kind of stuff. And now um, my ex-wife has a logo that I am so jealous of and she got it for like 59 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and I tried some of those services I, and I ended up tweaking them and changing some things. And I've done all kinds of things with, with our logos and stuff, but yeah, I know people have paid a lot of money and I know people who get something that is, if not as good, so close, it doesn't matter. So that's not an issue. And then we get the website um, and again, those same sources are also good for, I mean, Upwork, Fiverr, et cetera, are good for um, finding copywriters who can do things for you. Um, mm -hmm. So the first thing, and, and I love this, is I use the word complaint, but I think it's more about allowing the possibility that you can compete truthfully internationally now on a budget. Right. So. But I think the next question that's going to come out is, okay, now I have my website. Now I have my copy. We'll even throw in that I have my funnel. I have my, my uh, offer or whatever it is. And then they're going to get put into a funnel. Where am I, how do I get, how do I get to people? I mean, there's literally millions of websites starting up every day. How do I find my tribe, the people who want to use my services? what's the next step that you would recommend for them for that? That's an amazing question. And it is one of the most complex questions that I think has been overcomplicated. So in my business, one of the things I do is I help entrepreneurs answer all of these questions on a regular basis. And here's the thing. Everything works. Every day you can jump online and whatever neighborhood you're in online, there are a lot of people saying that everything is dead except for the thing that they're selling or the service they're promoting, right? Email's dead. If you're a social media person, email's dead. Uh, if you're an email person, social doesn't work, right? 
I have friends that are, they help people create YouTube content and YouTube channels. And they say, video is the way to do it. Everything else is dead. Well, that's not true. What's going to work the best for these people is to find a mechanism that's going to deliver the way that they're most suited to. So if you like talking and you're not shy, then probably podcasting and video is going to be a great medium for you. If you have no problem jumping on camera and it doesn't make you sweat and <laughs> you, you know, I mean, again, access to entry, three, $400 and you have a pro camera, video, microphone, audio setup, you're ready to go. You just have to have the ideas and the content. If you've already got your offer and you have a thing or a service that you're promoting, then it's you just telling that person how to buy it, how to access it, the benefits of it and getting really good at that. So I have a client and she struggled. She struggled with, I have to have a YouTube channel and maybe I should have a podcast and I should do this and that. And then finally I said, what are you, what do you really enjoy? And she said, well, I'm a really good writer. And I said, wow. Okay. So let's start doing content marketing, writing articles. Blogging is not dead if it's done in the right way. Blogging is not dead if you're able to write a con an article. So we then said, okay, you're going to pare it down to content marketing plan for your blog, for your, for your website, so that your content is out there first. And then we're going to adapt that content and put it onto Facebook. She has a Facebook group. She helps empower women. So she then took this article and she wrote this really empowering article about life in your 50s as a woman compared to life in your 20s and really went with a raw approach. And guess what? It's the most engaged piece that she's written all year. She has the most, like ladies are saying, where were you in my 20s? I love you. And she just needed that little bit of push to be aligned with her, her talents. And so again, if you are a writer and love writing, then go to those channels. Forget everything else. If you like talking and you're great on video and you're, you're the guy that can do some funny antics and handstands and cartwheels, do video and podcasting and things like that. And so I think that's really the biggest question is what, what are you most energetically aligned to and what will you match up with? Because guess what? That will then become, quote, easy to you. And when it's easy, it becomes fun. When it's easy and fun, it becomes more interesting and you're going to have a better staying power to be more interested in how do you build the craft? How do you develop your skills? It's the same question, David, that people ask me, what's the best martial art? And I said, well, the best martial art is one that matches your inclinations. I and, think that, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to say, I think that's, that's brilliant because I, I, I totally identify and I know a lot of people in the audience will is we feel these days that we have to be everywhere. I mean, when I talked to one person uh, who was giving me some suggestions, they said, you know, what you want to do is you want to be everywhere. You want your name to be everywhere. But the truth is, you don't need to actually be everywhere to be perceived as everywhere if your tribe or your audience all goes to one block of downtown. You just need to be in every store or on the billboards of that one block, and you don't need to be anywhere else. So right. I love what you're saying about whatever venue it is that resonates with you that is fun for you, start there and you know, I was talking to um, one of the icons from the New Media Summit, and I said, it just seems like you're everywhere. She says, no. She says, I target. I do a lot in one place, which is where my audience is, and you won't find me anywhere else at all. But in that one spot, in her case, it was Facebook. She was all over Facebook, everywhere you could possibly be, but you don't find her anywhere else at all. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that approach. And, and and the targeting options today are good. It's easy to target, but you are right on because for a lot of years in my own personal business, I didn't do a lot of social media. I, I meet my clients through networking events. I have content marketing systems that draw them in. I do a great job of engaging people in. I don't call people that are on my email service a subscriber. They're part of my audience. Because when they are part of my audience, now the onus is on me, not to necessarily be the performer, but to provide something of value to that audience, to treat them like an audience, to, to imagine like when you go to the rock concert or music concert and you pay for a ticket, 
you're expecting a value for that ticket. And the performer knows that he or she has to give said value back to the audience. And so I think just even the language and the mindset of how you frame these things up, I call my people an audience. Um, We call our people dojo members at Samurai Innovation because we have our dojo, our virtual dojo, and you're now part of the dojo. And then later on, they can advance into different parts of the dojo. Uh, And that's, I think, so I think you're right on in terms of finding and meeting people where they're at and then just selling and talking to that, that crowd and helping them. I love this idea of the audience because when it's an audience, um, it's somebody who has a vested interest in wanting you to, when people pay to buy a ticket, they want you to do well, mm-hmm. unless they're going to a demolition derby. We're not going to go there. <laughs> but, but, but basically, if somebody goes to a concert, if they go to a play, if they go to a performance of any kind, if they go to a lecture, they want you to do well. So your audience wants you to do well. And so it, it, I can see how that inspires you to want to give them what they're looking for. You know, I don't even want to say their money's worth because, again, they may not be paying at that point in, uh, to be part of your audience. But more important than that, it's not always about the money. You, it's, it's, you want the audience to support you, to wish you well. You want to support them, to give them something of value so that they want to stick around. And, you know, um, maybe they'll get something from you at one time. Uh, one of my friends, Christian Michelson, who's a mentor and a coach, I love the man, um, dear friend. Uh, I think he was talking about one point. He was saying that, you know, he has a huge mailing list, hundreds of thousands, and he said, only 20% of that list is ever going to buy something from me. But I don't care. I give everybody something of value because I'm adding to the world. I'm helping people. I'm, it, it doesn't matter that this percentage is. I just want to, in your, using your term, I just, want to do, I just want to serve my audience, which I think is brilliant because I think a lot of people, their, their mindset is too much on the money and not so much on the heart connection or the feeling or these other things. Um, what, how does he, now you mentioned uh, being part of the dojo. So, uh, and we haven't really touched on your special thing, which is samurai innovation. And I want to bring, I, I want to make sure we get your particular angle. What you've said so far has been useful, but, you know, let's talk about what samurai is. Let's talk about why, you feel that what you learned in martial arts is what's helping you build better business leaders. So the mic's yours. (laughs) What do you want to say, (laughs) Shane? Yeah, that's a great, it's a great start. So being a modern day samurai, I have a fourth degree black belt in the art of Aikido. It's a Japanese martial art. It's one of the newer martial arts. Uh, The founder, his name is Morihai Ueshiba. And he developed the art in the early 1900s, right around World War I. And it was called Aikibudo at that point. And it was a very combative style martial art, very effective for the wartime culture that he was living in. Um, Very much steeped in samurai tradition and hand-to-hand techniques and the weapon systems. And so it was a very effective system. But after World War I, he was really disgusted by humanity. And he said, like, how can we treat each other this way? And his only solution that he could come up with was to adapt Aikibudo to Aikido, which means the way of harmony. And so I love that. By, by the way, my, my son took Aikido when he was young and absolutely loved it. And then the te- we lived in a small town in the Midwest and then the teacher moved away and, you know, he was left out, but he loved it. He kept in touch with his teacher for years. Um, I think he's visited him as an adult, but he, he loved it. So I got to go to some of that. So I, I love that there's this coming around again. So keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's great. And I was just going to say, I love the fact that in your name is peace and harmony and be a superhero. So <laughs> we're very much aligned that way. But yeah, Aikido. So O Sensei, we call him O Sensei, meaning the first Sensei. Uh, and he decided like, there's got to be a way that I can change the art to create more harmony and have mankind and people harmonize together versus fight. And he did that. So he adapted the art into what we now know as Aikido. And it's all about blending. Instead of going like head to head with somebody, we now think about how do we blend with that person? 
And it's really about cultivating the mind, the body, and the spiritual and the emotional connections. And whether that's internally, because the training can teach you self-defense skills. And it can teach you how to not get punched or kicked or find yourself in a horrible situation or whatever. But then the training really, what he did then is he adapted it so that it started forging the inside of the person as well. And we started cultivating that mindset and that relationship between your mind, your physicality, and your spirituality. And it's a different approach to say, I'm just going to go show up at the dojo for 90 minutes, sweat, learn how to, you know, evade a punch or a kick and then go home versus I'm going to the dojo because I'm refining myself. And in the event that I ever would need to use and apply the martial art in real life, then my goal at that point is to save the individual, to not harm their body and maybe just bruise their ego. And, and we all walk away at the end of the day, peaceful, happy, intact, nobody's really injured. And that's a whole different training approach. And how do we train with that partner and how do we value that partner? So the dojo, I, I think in life, the dojo and churches and religious organizations are probably the only two places where you will find such a cross section, a demographic of people that come together for a common purpose. And in, in the dojo, we line up and we, we sit down in, in a seiza position, which is a kneeled sitting position. And we'll line up from the left side, the newest members of the dojo to the right side, the most senior members. And we bow into the senior instructor and we have our class. And what's amazing is down the line, we call it the line, you will have the CEO, the accountant, the tax advisor, the police officer, the stay at home mom, the retired person, the youth person, all sitting there together. And these people in a million years never would connect in just day to day living. But they come to the dojo, they connect, and they, they start harmonizing together. And it's really a beautiful thing to see. And then when you're training, you realize that you need that training partner. So you can't, you ha- you can't, um, you can't disrespect their body on the mat. You want to train together. You want to challenge each other. And so it actually forges really great people. Now, when you take that philosophy into the boardroom or you go to work, or you're out at the grocery store, we realize that people in those settings are just as valuable as they are in the dojo. And that we should honor and respect people in those settings just as we do in the dojo. And so that starts changing the way that we're maybe less offended. Sure, does a guy cut me off in traffic? May may I get mad? Maybe. Would somebody, you know, jump in line in front of me at the grocery store? Sure. Do I need to get all upset about it? Not really. So I think what happens is it teaches us greater level of skills for conflict resolution. And then that's the piece of it that I start taking into the work that I do with clients. I I love that. um, The idea of, you know, uh, conflict resolution, because if you're going in with the idea of resolution, often you can just avoid the conflict. Um, Right. You know, I'm going to give a a little plug here for our Peace and Harmony program. Um, We've had people put it on their laptop when they go into the boardroom with all these other departments and everything, and they have their spreadsheet in front of it, and they're just playing the Peace and Harmony program in the background, and it completely changes the dynamics of the meeting because everybody's more calm, and when you're more calm, your thinking is clearer, you make better decisions. You know, we'd like to see that going on in all the major decision making places in the world, um, especially in the country at this point when apparently decisions may not, we don't know what's going on, but it looks pretty crazy in the world. But, but I love this idea of making harmony the goal because I, I know they don't do, I, I, because so often uh, the angle that we're presented with is what's different about, um, find the differences between um, and I don't think that's necessary anymore in the world. I think, you know, we have a lot of programs at, at my website that may serve you, but they may not. But, and, but I, what I will tell you is whatever problem you're trying to solve, whether it's a health or a relationship or whatever, 
if we have something and it works for you, great. If we don't, somebody does. Here's my friend, here's somebody who's on the podcast, who's this friend, he offers something completely different. Here's somebody else who I, who I just know from a friend is good. The point is that you can find the solution for whatever it is that you want. And I honestly believe that there's enough to go around that we don't need to in any way be competitive. I think that it's it's a, a situation that um, we have, you know, coconut flavored ice cream and they have strawberry flavored ice cream. There's enough people who want coconut. There's enough people who want strawberry. I don't have to say, oh, well, strawberries, blah, blah, blah. I don't have to go there. So I love this idea. So tell me more about when you get into the workplace. So we started talking. So now... Uh, if you don't mind, let's just follow the sequence. We've gotten somebody who's now they've got their website up. They've got their, uh, your person used blogs so, uh, or writing. So let's stay with that. Now, what's the, what are the principles from Samurai that you want to guide your people with next? What's the, take, take me to the next step with your, with your people. So you work with people yeah. one-on-one in, uh, and their companies, correct? Yeah, correct. So sometimes, so I have a couple different capacities, coaching and consulting primarily. So coaching is working with the executives, the leaders or the owner of the business. And that's a one on one. And sometimes I will go in and deploy a workshop to their team so that we can get the team onto the shared goals and aligned with the direction that the leader or the owner wants to go. And, and so that's one track. And then there's a consulting track where I will go in and help solve a problem and, and give very specific prescriptive step-by-step directions and solutions for them to then deploy on their own. And so there's two different ways that I can go about doing that. Okay. So let's say you've got somebody now, they've got their website up, they've got their blog going, which is, and you're, maybe they're doing something on Facebook. So again, they're building an audience. What are the next principles that you want to share with them that can help Service. them? Okay. So yeah. let's, let's talk about that. And do you want to talk about it in terms of, you know, where you meet? It's called the dojo. Am I getting that correct? So let's talk about, um, you know, the samurai aspects, what you feel that that knowledge and experience that you bring to, you know, that's, that, that helps you target your particular audience or I know a lot of people like the word tribe. I like both. I mean, they're all good. Just the idea of where your people are. So. Yeah. So I think it's important just to set the stage here that, that in my world, if I'm looking at the real dojo and I'm in the dojo training, we always have something called the moment of truth. And the moment of truth is when the sensei calls two students up into the center of the mat. And he says to one of them, I want you to attack David with an overhead strike. And David now has to defend himself. And maybe the sensei calls out the technique and says, David, I want you to use Shihonage to defend yourself. And you have to execute that technique. Or it could be freestyle, David, defend yourself. And the sensei wants to see what you've got. And the moment of truth is that there's no readiness for that. You just have to be able to perform. So I've always taken that into the work that I do with clients is that anything we do has to be real world battle tested. They have to be strategies that work. It can't be just a bunch of theories that I would like you to try something because I would not be in business very long if we just had theory based uh, (laughs) coaching going on. So it has to be real world. So the first thing is from a samurai perspective is samurai means to serve. So the mindset that I always do a check with clients on is how are you serving your tribe, your audience, your customer, your client, your guest, your whatever you want to call that person that your business is designed to serve. How are you serving them? And then we get talking about the value equation, which is how are you adding value to that group first? Because you're right. Going back to the original conversation, when you're a smaller owner operator, It's easy to say, I need to earn X number of dollars per month. I need to generate revenue. I need to do this. But you're in an I conversation at that point. Until we flip it around and say, how can I go out and deliver value to the guest, 
or the group. And I, David, I have 20 years of hospitality experience behind me. I've got 15 years of property management, parking asset management experience. I've had several careers where, but it, where my experience is different, but in each one of those, the question of how do I add value? How do I serve that customer or that guest? That doesn't change. So that's the foundational part is that we have to go through and ask, how are we serving the person that you're, that you're going to be doing a transaction with at some point in the future? And you made a good point earlier is that, yeah, Christian Michelson, I've met him over the years and gone to his conferences. He's a great guy, but it's the right thinking in the sense that they may not be my client or guest or customer today, but I want to hopefully persuade them down the road when they are ready that I would be the right company and the right match for them. And so, the, you know, obviously there's customer value journeys and there's all these different tools and strategies that we use to think about that. But it's important to answer that question. How am I adding value to tribe, audience, customer, client, guest, participant, whatever you're going to call that group? I'd, I love that you brought this up because there is a mentality that I know uh, way back when uh, we ran a store for a while. I know other people who have worked in some, you know, we've all had different jobs in our careers that, that, you know, we all grew up, you know, we all did the dishwashers or whatever. Um, one of the things that uh, can happen is, you know, from the, the owners of the management side, I have to pay the bills, therefore, and they get caught up in that. But the workers always also get up. And I, I love now that things are online, it's a little bit different. But, it, but I've heard people say, I could get, if it weren't for all these customers coming in the store, I could get my job done. And seriously mean it and be as upset at the customers coming in, not making the connection, you know, which is why they're not management they're at that level. And you see that, like, I'm trying to keep this, you know, so I love that you talk about, you know, giving programs to a company so that they're in alignment with the thinking of, you know, the leader so that they get that, you know, if the customers don't come in, if you're not, if you're, if you don't have more boxes to ship at the end of the day, than when you came in, how are you going to get paid? How are we going to grow? So, yeah, so I have a good example. I have a client um, and they run a certain business and they, they do gifting business. And, and I did a workshop with them a few months ago. And, and initially the conversation was, well, how do I grow my business? And I was looking at these metrics and that's the owner of the business. And she was asking me that. And so we got into talking about culture and leadership and the team and what their skills were like. And it came out that there's a big opportunity to build some skills into her team to develop better relationships with their clients. And so, so we did a workshop and the whole idea of that workshop was becoming the trusted advisor for those clients. Yeah. Becoming the go-to person that when David has a question about buying a gift, he can call Shane knowing that Shane's going to have his best interest at heart. Right. And Shane's going to say, David, what kind of gift, what kind of budget, who's it going to? What, what do you want a wow factor or is it more of a sympathy gesture? And because the, the, the nature of the event is going to determine the gift and how that all needs to be delivered. And, and so we went through that and that, that was the biggest value of the workshop for them is realizing we actually can cultivate that relationship. Yeah. And, and we can actually do more than what we have been doing versus just being an order taker. We can actually cultivate that relationship. And again, I love what you said about having their best interests at heart. There's an old movie, black and I think it's black and white still, uh, Miracle on 34th Street from way, way, way back when. And uh, the whole point is that it's Macy, I think it's Macy's department store, Santa Claus is actually Santa Claus. So, um, <laughs> uh, or he's close enough. You can never quite tell, but he does things. And at one point he's got somebody on his lap and uh, the kid wants something. He says, oh, we don't have that there. You have to go to Gimbel's, which is, you know, Macy's and Gimbel's in New York were the big competitors and everything. And uh, initially when the bosses found out about that, they were all up in arms and wanted to ready to fire him. But the feedback came back that, oh, here's a reliable source so that 
more and more people started coming in. So when you have their best interests at heart, and maybe we have something that will work for you, but if we don't, how about here? How about there? How maybe you need to maybe you need a, an individually created it. You need to talk to Bob and Fred and Mary to put together the package that you want in the gifts or whatever it is. That idea of service, I think, is hugely profound. And I think a lot of people, I, I think. So what I'd like to address is the fear factor, and mm. that is. How do I pay the rent? If I, it's, it's very easy as a business owner and as somebody trying to launch a business, or even if it's been in going for a while, especially with COVID, a lot of things have kind of, how is it that you can stay in the service attitude and not go into the, oh my God, how am I going to you know, pay the bills, pay the rent, pay my workers, whatever it is. Um, what does Samurai have to offer us about staying in that frame of mind or out of that frame of mind? Well, I think there's, there's definitely a time and a place for everything. And so there is a time and a place that you need to create space to sit down with your books or your accountant or bookkeeper and say, what are the real facts? What do we need to make payroll this month? What do we need to pay the rent? What's in, the, what's in our cash reserves? How long is that gonna last if we have zero customers versus the current customers? And you do need to be honest and realistic and do that analysis. So don't shy away from that because that'll just create more fear. Knowing your numbers is a, is a real important part of the equation. When I worked at, um, so I'm Canadian and, and one of the companies I worked with for five years early on was a company called Tim Hortons. They're a coffee company. And they're very iconic in Canada and they've been spreading into the United States over the years. And one of the things that was interesting is we knew that the average store needed about 1,200 transactions to break even that day. And then we would know by the time the 10 a.m. morning rush was done, we would look and see what was the transaction count. And then we would know it was high enough, we can keep the schedule the same, or it was too low that day for whatever reason because it snowed and people stayed home from work or whatever, that we'd have to cut staff from the lunch in the afternoon time to make the store profitable. So, having realistic knowledge of what's going on in your business is the number one starting points. And, and a lot of people like shy away from that. Don't shy away from that. Just know it, but have a space for that and then leave it there and then go into the space of now I'm back into value creation. How do I market? How do I bundle? How do I discount? How do I pivot? How do I, how do I, how do I run a flash sale to generate some revenue right now? I mean, you can run a flash sale and discount things 50% for one day only, and that's not going to wreck your business model. If you do it intentionally, you communicate it well. So there's always a time and a place for everything. And I think the focus of that gets lost in the fear and the panic of, I have to make payroll by Friday and I'm five grand short. Those are real things. And so we don't want to dismiss it, but we also don't want to hide from it. So that's just being, being courageous enough to address it head on. So, so are there particular techniques uh, or is it just the overall growth from being a samurai that helps you be so even with, with that situation? Because it's real easy, especially if the spouse or somebody gets uh, freak somebody who may be not as involved in the business, not fully understanding. It's really easy to get caught up in the, oh my God, what am I going to do? Um, there are, you know, uh, many books, uh, there's a book, uh, W. Clement Stone and Napoleon Hill success through succeed through success through a positive mental attitude or something like that. I think right. that's what, and, and he talks about, uh, W. Clement Stone, who was hugely successful in the insurance field, um, talked about a major blow that happened to him one day and how he handled that, which was not tell anybody, didn't tell his wife, just did a prayer thing, then a dread, then just leapt in and just called the key person and said, why are you doing this? What's going on? What's the real problem? What do we need to do? And he got the whole thing handled. I want to say in a day and a half, if I remember, where it went from him having no business whatsoever, his whole business collapsing to him being fine, but just losing some small portion or something. And I think things need to be done to develop that, I want to say equanimity, to develop that ability 
to not be blown over by every single sale or every single good day or bad day. Um, what's your feeling about that? What, it, what tips or suggestions do you have to help in that arena? Consistency in systems. So, so we need systems in our business, right? We need to have, the, it's why the accounting world runs on a month end. All accountants across the world run a calendar. They have a month end. They have deadlines to meet their reporting requirements and stuff because that then goes upstream and helps other people in the business make decisions based on those numbers. And if you're looking at your numbers on a monthly basis, that means business is good. But if business is down and sales are down and traffic's down and things aren't happening, you're looking on a weekly basis. You're doing reforecasts. You're, you're asking the what ifs and you're trying to figure that out in, on a weekly basis. So there's, there's a system to that. I think a lot of entrepreneurs, and it goes back to the original conversation we started with, how do, you, how do you be like a big business? Well, big businesses have systems. They have month ends, they have month end reviews, quarterly reviews, they've got regional meetings that happen two or three times a year. Um, and they're always looking at how do we move the business forward? They have marketing committees that are saying, what are the new products and services we're gonna launch? When are we doing it? And all that kind of stuff. So you need to have, it goes back to my earlier comment about a time and a space. You need to create space for things to happen. So that, that, that really is the beginning point. Maybe I can share a story with you that would please this. So we just came through a really rough patch of the pandemic start and COVID and all that kind of stuff. And hopefully we're on to greener, sunny days from here on in, which I believe we are. And I think there's, there's going to definitely need to be, some behavioral adaptations in different regions and things like that. But I'm confident that that's, that's going to happen. And we have smart people in our country and your country that are figuring these things out. But I have a client who runs a hair salon in a small town in Northern Alberta where I live. It's 180,000 people. She runs a small salon and does a really great job of it. And when COVID came, she had called me and she was in tears and basically saying, I think this is going to be the end. And I said, why would you say that? And she goes, well, like, how am I going to operate, Shane, if I have no people to cut their hair and I, they can't come in and the government's forcing me to close? And I said, well, hold on. In the last two years, we've been working together to develop her business from the inside out. Okay. One of the things that we did was she has a great culture, David. She does an amazing job. She is so dialed into her business She's so involved in her team and building them up and educating them. And so there's this amazing little culture that's inside the business and she's done a great job. And I said, we need to bring that out onto your website. So we redid the website and started showcasing the culture through blogs and articles and videos and just, just letting that be present, developing that into social. And so we were connecting the two of them and we'd already laid a foundation when COVID came upon the scene and the government mandated, mandated she had to shut down, we made a major pivot and we went back out to her customer base through social media, through the website. And we started saying, Hey, the number one problem that you have right now is how are you going to wash and condition and style your hair? You still have to go to a, maybe a virtual meeting on zoom or you still have to you know, be human and we don't want you to resort to drugstore products and pharmacy products and you know, other things like that. So here's what you do. You go to our website, have a look on our brand product page, tell us what you need, fill out this form, we'll get back to you. And then she would go in, phone them up, take payment over the phone, and then deliver their product and a nice little gift bag and on their doorstep, contact free. And guess what? 85% of her normal revenue was captured. Yeah, fabulous. And we increased the cultural value because her cultural relational capital quadrupled. People were writing notes on, their, on our social media page saying, I can't believe you're going like three extra miles for me. I can't believe um, that you dropped off little samples in the bag and extra goodies that I didn't even pay for or ask for. And now when we were coming out of COVID and we were looking at re-entry and reopening, she had 300 people lined up that wanted their hair cut next week. Wow. Because they were just, they, they want to support the salon and they are deeply engaged with the salon and they look at the salon 
as a part of like, she's not just a commoditized product or service anymore. She is an extension of that person's world. It's like, I need, I need those ladies to cut my hair. I don't go anywhere else, even though there's 25 other options within a 10 mile radius. Right. And so that's kind of, that's to me, that's like one example of what we created because she had been modifying her mindset through the coaching process over the last two years and changing from maybe a more of a scarce mindset to more of an abundant mindset, like you were saying earlier. Hey, if, it's, if I'm not the right provider for you, somebody else is, right? That's an yeah. abundant mindset. And, and it's hard to be abundant <laughs> when you are faced with real situations like, how do I make rent? How do I make payroll? But here was a very real situation. And I just said to her, if you trust me enough, give me the steering wheel. Let me drive this for you. And you just participate and we're going to come out of this. And I mean, the results were better than I had envisioned going into it. I knew we could generate results and sales for her, but it was fantastic. And it was because she had started laying the foundation earlier on and started engaging that culture and looking at how do I add more value in. So it was fantastic. It was an amazing experience. That sounds great. And what I, what I love about it, Shane, is, is that the true answer is it starts with, I I have this client base. How do I serve them more now that the bridge is out now that the, whatever the, now that it's flooded and we need to bring their services by boat or whatever it is. It's how do I serve them more seems to be the basis of the solution that built a greater loyalty and stuff because I, I mean, you, you can see it on the, I, I, they seem to have solved it now, but on the late night talk show hosts, they were all, all of their hair and beards and everybody getting interviewed was like, I, I don't know. I guess they all forgot how to shave. I don't know what it was, but <laughs> there's uh, Stephen Colbert and whatever. This his hair is like really getting ridiculously long and all these other ones. And it's like, they still need it to be done. How do we serve them? What can we do to help them in that situation? So, and I think this is, this is a brilliant tactic to come back and, you know, when I'm feeling small, when I'm feeling the lack of abundance to come to, to come back to abundance to say, well, let's forget about me for a while. What do other people need? How can I serve them? And then we just try just what you said to, to your client. If you trust, if you trust me, we can get through this. If we trust ourselves, if we trust what's going on, we can allow you know, use the term pivot. Some people do major changes, whatever the term is, that whatever's happening is happening. I don't know. You what, it, the, the potential is there for something good to come out of it if we're open and we allow it to happen and we look for it. You know, what's good being presented in this moment? How can I, how can I make this better? Because when you do what she's done, the loyalty for it, potentially decades to come is substantial and loyalty in this day and age is huge. Huge. Yeah. You know, you were talking about Clement Stone, Napoleon Hill, and one of the major principles I've always taken away from Napoleon Hill is the seed of equivalent benefit. That in every opportunity or disaster, there's always a seed of equivalent benefit, meaning there's always something amazing that can come from it if you're looking for it. Right. And, um, And, you know, like going back to my hairstyling client, one of the things that we had started doing back in the, like the beginning of 2020 was that the question I asked her was, okay, so what's the next level of serving your client? And so we were really focused for the last year on increasing her retail sales. And so that's the shampoo and conditioner and things like the different styling products that the ladies take home. And, and for some of the stylists, they're shy and they feel like it's, it's sleazy to sell something to the lady in the chair. And, and we had to change that mindset that if you don't offer her, like you've, she's just spent $200 having you professionally style her hair. She looks amazing. She's going out. If you don't offer her the techniques and the styling products that on Wednesday, she can replicate that. Then you're doing a disservice. And the, yes. and the stylists, their minds opened up to the fact that, oh, I'm actually, yeah, you make sense. Like how do I teach her how to have that same hairstyle all next week when she goes back to work. Right. So now it's like, Hey, Mrs. Smith, if you would like to have 
the, it, do you look good right now? And she's like, yeah, I look great. I feel great. Great. I want to show you what you need to take home with you so that you can look this great next week or the week after whenever you choose to look this way. And then, so that started increasing it. And so I said to my client, what's the next evolution? And I asked her, why don't we start sampling? And so we went and we sourced a little one ounce bottle with a flip cap. We had a custom label made. So this goes back to how she's looking like a big brand now. Right. A professionally printed label, a professionally made little uh, plastic uh, polyethylene bottle with a flip cap. And then they were filling in the product. And so we know that. At, I'm sorry, at her place, they were, she, her own staff were filling in the product. They got yeah, her, the bottle. Her staff they, were filling. Okay. Because they have what they call the back bar. So they've got 40 different of the, like the five gallon jugs with pumps and stuff. And so right. what we would do is we would say, hey, David, I know you normally use this type of shampoo. Would you be interested in a different shampoo? And he says, yeah, sure. And so we wash your hair with that shampoo that day. And how do you like it? Yeah, I like it. Would you like to take some home? I'm not sure. I still have a liter of the old stuff. Okay, great. We would then go fill up a sample bottle of the stuff we just washed your hair. And we'd put it in the bag with you and you would go home. And then when you run out of the old stuff, you'd try the sample and then the, the, the client could make their choice. So we just started this program. Well, guess what? When we started shifting from no sales, no people in the salon to the home delivery program, we started throwing in a couple samples and guess what line we just brought in? Literally weeks before uh, the shutdown happened, we brought in a, a natural organic hand cleanser and hand moisturizer. Well, that's what we were putting in samples because we know people were increasing their hand washing during you know, COVID and things like that. And that's, that reciprocated where people were coming back on social media saying, I got my bag, it was awesome, and you threw in some goodies. That's incredible, thank you. And so it's that willingness to say, well, what can we do to innovate? The question we asked last November, the way we solved it, we came up with a, an approach that was right for her, custom, unique to her. And now that, now that has been paying off hugely for her. Okay. So um, that is uh, really cool. I'm very happy with that story. But now I want to come back full circle. Um, how much money are we talking about? Because, again, when we're talking about somebody who wants to be a local shop but have the, the wherewithal and the benefits of, you know, national stuff, you know, some people are starting on a shoestring. Some people have a little bit of money saved up. Some people are doing it, you know, especially if they're, if they're starting with an online website is I'm starting that while I'm still keeping my accounting job I'm, to the extent right. that I can. But I obviously want to leave that. What kind of budgets do you feel um, are useful for people? Well, I, I mean, give me something to work with here. You know, I, I talked to, to somebody else that we did an interview with, and he said, basically, you know, before I can help you, you need to have at least 500 to 1,000 people on your email list to basically love you. And then mm -hmm. from there, I can take you to, you know, eight figures and beyond, but you got to start somewhere. So if somebody's just starting out or maybe they've been doing it for a little while and they're small, and during COVID, a lot of people have been starting their own online thing, what do you feel is a reasonable budget or how do you, how do you, how to make the most use of their funds because maybe I can't afford to, maybe I can give away download online, but I don't, I can't go giving out a hundred bottles without panic. Right. Yeah. So what you're talking about, I've, I've done it myself. So I started Samurai Innovation off the side of my desk. I had a full-time day job. I was working, managing a company, 300 employees, busy job but I knew I wanted to do something different. And so I started a blog. I started a website. About a year in, I realized the name was wrong. The market was wrong. I shifted it and Samurai Innovation was born. And so whether you want to use the term bootstrapping it or shoelacing it or whatever term you want, the approach that I took was I set a budget. That was my initial seed money that I used for my startup. So it goes back to saying whether it's 300 bucks, 500 bucks, a thousand, $5,000, wherever you are at, set a budget. 
then find out what do you need. So you need a website, you need hosting, you need a theme provider, you need, you need a brand designer to help you with some branding, a logo, some stuff like that. And then find out what can you get for your budget and then start. Now, what I would do is I had a monthly budget. So I was prepared to subsidize the business for the first little while. And I had a monthly budget, a few hundred dollars a month that I could put toward, maybe it was marketing or it was product creation or whatever the case is. And you start and then you, the most important is the time budget. Okay. So the time budget is the more important than the money, David, because what I would do is I would say, okay, when am I going to work on my business? And for me, it was Tuesday nights and Saturdays. Okay. Tuesday night, I would sit down and I would just do as much, whether it was building some website stuff or building an article, creating an article or making a video, I would build that on Tuesday night and Saturday. And then I started taking coaching clients. Guess when I did my coaching? Saturdays. It was always Saturdays because I still had my day job. And so I found clients that wanted to be coached on Saturday and they were easy to find. And then as the business started growing and I started realizing a profit, what I did next was figured out what amount could I reinvest in? So in the beginning it was, this business is great. It's not going to, it's not going to allow me to replace my full-time income yet, but it's going to pay for a vacation or two. It's going to pay for, you know, it paid my car payment for a while. It did a few different things, but then I would also have a certain amount of the income where I would say, okay, now I'm going to invest that. So now I'm going to invest it back into my education and I'll take an online marketing course. And now I'll learn how to build my website or I'll take an online marketing course or I'll, I will hire someone to do the copy. You know, I hired someone at one point and they came in and wrote some articles for me and they did some copywriting because I, again, only had a certain amount of time budget. And then as I started taking clients on, the actual time budget to work on the business reduced. So then, but that was okay because I now had income that I could outsource some stuff. So to me, it's the time budget and having consistency in that so that you keep your day job running. That's, that's great. But now, whether it's one night a week, two nights a week, 10 hours a week, you run that budget and you get the maximum out of that budget and then you don't feel guilty and you have a plan. You go into that week asking yourself, what am I going to do for my 10 hour time budget to build my business? And then do only the highest, best use of your time and talents and abilities and then move forward that way. So that strategy has worked for me. It's worked for my clients. It's worked for friends that I've said, try it this way. It always works. What I love is, and, uh, is this idea of consistency and patience and putting it all together. I can't help but think that that also comes back to your samurai background, to your um, Aikido, that just learning that things take time. So many people are looking for the, what can I do today so I can retire tomorrow afternoon by four? <laughs> you know, and, uh, you, you know, the, what's your, what's your, what's your plan? I'm going to win the lottery. That's how I'm going to make, you know, my fortune. And this idea of, you know, okay, we'll put together a plan and we'll just start. And I love that you did it for a year and then realized that you needed to make some shifts because as we grow, we realize that sometimes what we originally thought we were doing may not be the alignment kind of gets more set as we move forward. We start realizing, oh, it isn't that that I want to do. It isn't vanilla ice cream that I want to sell. It's marble pistachio that I want to sell. But that's okay. We've been moving in the ice cream direction, so it's not that big of a shift, but it can make all the difference to us. Because if we're the only one making pistachio ice cream, um, you know, swirl ice cream and people want it, and there is a tribe that will only want that just, you just need to connect with them. Um, I know we mentioned it earlier. You have a special planning course that you've created called the eight no fail planning methods. And you want to give that to our listeners and they go to HTTP colon no fail plans.com N O F A I L P L A N S.com nofailplans.com and they can get this and that will connect them. So you'll give them some more ways to connect with you if they want to. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a course that I produce because I have a lot of clients that 
come in and productivity and how do I get these things done and just what we were talking about. Okay, so what do I do in my six or eight or 10 hour time budget to work on my part-time business? Or if you're a full-time at it, then what do I do and what's the what do I have to do? And so I created this course and I sell it on our site. So I'm happy to gift that to, to people to develop a relationship and add value in advance to them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, it's a simple course. You can get through it in about an hour and there's going to be one of eight methods that's going to call out to you, resonate. And then my, my ask is just try it out, put it to work, test it out. And if it doesn't work, there's seven more. You're going to find the one that's going to get you a marginal shift in your productivity. And that's going to do a lot of good things for you. Cool. So uh, thank you for offering that. Um, I want to, you know, you talked about something in the notes that you sent me, which is to help people understand how balance is a myth. Um, let's talk about that for a minute, because that's the only thing I think we haven't covered that would be good to get to today, unless maybe there's something else that you can think of and throw it in. No, I'm but, good to go with that. Let's keep going. Okay. So um, what do you mean by balance is a myth? Well, when we, and so yeah, this comes from Aikido training as well. When you try to balance things, you're playing an either or game, like an if or. So I'm trying to balance work 70 hours a week, grow my career, get the next promotion, grow the business, whatever your focus is in that work arena. But I'm trying to be dad of the year at home. And so I'm trying to make it to the hockey games and the this and the practice and it. And in the middle, you're going to combust because you can't be perfect employee or leader and perfect dad of the year and win all the awards and then feel fulfilled as a human being as well. And so you're, you're going to lose a game somewhere and then that isn't going to make you feel good because you're now going to be out of balance. And so one of the things, it's, it's a myth. So when we go to what I call work-life harmony, the question now is how do I harmonize these different demands? How do I take my goals and aspirations at work? Maybe you're in a really peak season. Everyone has a peak season. Accountants have peak season between January and May every year. They have to get tax season done and they have a huge push. But then they come off of that and they take some time off. Like I know my accountant, after peak accounting season is done, they take every Friday off from, from May until August. And that's how they reclaim some of the extra time they put in in the wintertime. Great. So you have a high energy output season, you're going to cycle down into a low energy season. So harmonizing is, okay, dad or mom is going to be at work. They're in this high energy season. They're working six days a week, 10, 12 hours a day. How do they harmonize that with the rest of the family? How do they harmonize that with their, themselves and say, well, maybe I can't go to the gym six days a week in this season, but I can go four. And in those four sessions, what am I going to be doing? And, and how can I adapt my eating so that, you know, I don't have to worry about gaining 10 pounds because I'm, I'm not eating correctly. And so it's a question is, how do I harmonize that? How do I make all things work together? And when you ask that question, it's a hard question because it's like, well, I don't know if I can or can't. That's the value of having a friend, a confidant, a coach, or somebody that you can get some external perspective on. But it's, it's then saying, I'm going to have a major push and then you're going to go down. So an example. When I was uh, a few years ago, my sensei came to town from Japan and he said, I'm coming back in 18 months and I'm testing you and your three other friends for your yonden, which is your fourth degree black belt. I will see you then. And it was like, oh no, I, there's a lot of preparation to go for that test. It's your, it's your last test in Aikido. So as time went on and about six months out, I sat down with my wife and said, look, my training has to increase for the next six months. I still have teaching responsibilities at the dojo. I still have work. I have, and at that time, I was still working my day job, running Samurai Innovation, training. And so I said, how are we going to put this together when I need to be physically training and preparing 15 to 20 hours a week for my test? And so her and I mapped out a date night. We're non-negotiable. Date night's going to happen on these nights. We're going to do stuff on this other nights. What's our cooking schedule is going to be? I cook half the meals. She cooks half the meals. And that's harmony because we, we put everything on the table. We created a plan. We negotiated. We had agreement. And guess what? It went off really well. And there was no 
no guilt, there was no criticism, condemnation, nobody felt left out, and everything was managed. And that's, that's, the, ba- that's the benefit of work-life harmony when you can make those things harmonize because you're intentionally asking that question versus saying, I'm going to just balance it all. I'm going to hope and pray it all works out. And, <laughs> and somewhere along the way, something explodes and now you're frustrated. Well, I, coming from a company that is called Peace and Harmony, we love the <laughs> idea of harmony. Um, and just a, a shout out again that we have these systems that can help harmonize because while you're saying this, and I'm certainly getting it from your side of very evenness, um, I know in my situation and in a lot of situations, when I sit down to say this is what I'm doing with people, no matter how much they support, we want them to be emotionally nourished as well and not feel, well, you're putting this instead of, you know, this. I don't want to say it this way because I know how important it is to you, but I have a uh, a friend who's uh, very her she wanted her whole career to be about horses she was a hospice nurse so she's dealing with people dying and and she had a horse or two or something um, and her teenage son at one point said something about she spent an awful lot of time and money on her hobby not getting that that was really where she wanted to move not getting that if you're dealing with people dying all the time, you need something to help Mm. nourish you after that. Um, And so, you know, in that situation, how do we keep the harmony going? And I love what you talked about, but in that particular case, maybe some supplemental things. I don't know, maybe we have a product, maybe we don't, but I love what you're saying about just have the intention, let's make this, let's, let's create the harmony, let's do whatever, let's balance off the time, let's figure it out. And I think that's, that's something well worth striving for. I personally think that if we sit down and, and do it sanely, that virtually, no, I think every problem on the planet can be resolved with all the resources we currently have, except I don't think people are thinking clearly and therefore... Hmm you know, they're creating problems for themselves and for others. Um, Shane, what else? I'm really good. And I think what you've given us is very valuable. Do you have any ending words of advice or wisdom or just a shout out that they should all call you and hire you? What, (laughs) how would you like to end today? How more, how can I serve you more? They can connect with me through the course and, from there we can connect and we can start a relationship and that would be great. But I think the, the one thing that I just need to answer your question and give it the one piece of advice. So the answer to your question with your friend is, is meeting needs. Everybody has a set of needs that they have to, that they meet and you will meet them positively and intentionally, or you will not meet them positively and you will meet them negatively and unintentionally. And so one question that can get around that is how do we make this work? That's another way of getting at that whole work-life harmony is how do we make this work for you and for me? And what would work? And so maybe there would be an, would have been an opportunity had she'd asked that earlier that her son would realize that, gee, this is, this is an important part of mom's mental sanity, recovery from the hard work that she does. Uh, I mean, it's tough. You can't really go home and tell a young child the ins and outs and nitty gritty of a hospice worker, but, or, you know, that, that's a very interesting care pro- profession. So it's hard to tell children about that, but it's easy to say, but when I'm with the horses, I am rejuvenated. I feel better. And would you like to come? And would you like to come to the stables and, you know, walk a horse with me? And so there are, there are ways to say, well, how do we meet your needs? And, and, you know, if you let me go to the stables for Saturday afternoon, what would you like to do on Sunday afternoon? And so the word of advice I'll give to, to everyone listening today is it comes down to one word, and that's expectation. In business, in life, setting an expectation is half the battle. If we set an expectation, if you're McDonald's and you set an expectation that for $5 you get this said hamburger, and here's the qualities and the nutrients in the hamburger, and you pay $5 and you get what's on the picture, you feel satisfied. Now, whether it's the best or worst hamburger, who cares? They've delivered on their expectation to you. 
You go to Starbucks and they sell you a beautiful drink and it's handcrafted and you get to sit in a nice comfortable chair and that's why you pay five or six or seven dollars for that beverage versus another coffee shop that'll sell you a similar product for three dollars. Um, maybe they have plastic chairs you're sitting on. So I think the question is, what expectation am I setting? And then what's the agreement to that expectation? And that solves a lot of problems uh, in personal and, and professional living. That sounds fabulous. Um, Shane, thank you so much for your time. This has been very valuable. I wish you all success. Um, I hope we connect again sometime in, in soon. Um, I love what you're doing and how you're helping people become bigger without being bigger, without having to come up with all the resources and everything. And uh, I loved your stories and thank you for sharing and thank you for being here today. Thank you for the opportunity to serve your folks, David. Okay, we'll talk again soon. And so this wraps up another episode of Here We Come to Save the Day. Uh, stop by peaceandharmonyco.com, see if we have something that can help you. And if you want peace in your family, neighborhood, community, you can just buy it. It's really simple. And it comes with a guarantee that if you don't notice something in three days, you can send it back. Shipping is on us. And um, I mean, People say they want peace and they want harmony and here's a way they can get it. And they can also take advantage of Shane's uh, program. Um, go to nofailplans.com and take advantage of his eight no-fail planning methods. And thank you again, Shane, for being here today. Thank you, David. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to another helpful, fun, and life-changing episode of Here We Come to Save the Day with David Adelson. To access the show notes and additional resources, go to herewecometosavetheday.com. If you've enjoyed the show and find it helpful and fun, please leave us a review and share with a friend. Tell us issues troubling you or questions you have. We're here to help you. That's what Here We Come to Save the Day is all about. Till next time.